Let's begin. My name is Dave Bergen. Uh, I welcome you to this uh, webcast, a uh, follow-up to the Global Leadership Summit that took place last Thursday and Friday in Canada, and was an extended webcast based on the, the home site uh, event which took place in Chicago earlier this summer. I want to welcome uh, especially our panelists here today, Jamie Arpin Reese to my left, and Don Rampel Boschman, and on my right, Christine Entz and Cheryl Pauls, uh, leaders in different areas of church life and, uh, and community life. And I thank you for coming to join us today and to interact. Each of, each of these folks was also a part of the uh, part of the summit last week and are prepared to respond to a number of questions as we interact with what we heard and what we learned. I also want to uh, welcome all of your viewers who have joined us from across Canada. Uh, we have over 50 people who are logging in and we're very pleased with your participation. Also in the room here with us, two people from CMU who uh, are out of town leaders joining us, Deanna Lepke and Paul Peters. I want to welcome you as well. Thanks for joining us. Um, one of the reasons that you got such a good deal to register for this event is because of a uh, very supportive partnership that we have with Max Canada, which is a mutual insurance company in Canada, which supports the life of the faith community. So we're also grateful to their participation to make this possible. I want to just briefly introduce again our panelists. Um, you did receive a, a fuller bio for each of them. But Jamie, to my left here, is pastor at Little Flowers Community here in Winnipeg. He's also a writer, a uh, missional church planter. He's married to his wife, Kim, and they have a son uh, who originates in Ethiopia. His name is Micah. And he's the founding pastor of Little Flowers Community, which is a Franciscan and a Baptist faith community in the downtown west end of the city. Uh, to my right here is Christine Enns. She works for the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce. Wave the camera. <laughs> um, she's the Director of Membership and Marketing, and she's act an active member at Home Street Mennonite Church in Winnipeg. Cheryl Pauls, to her right, is the incoming president of Canadian Mennonite University. Um, she begins her role officially on November 1st, but I know that she's already been very engaged with this in many ways. She's been on the faculty here at the university for over 50, for 15 years, and she's been teaching in the area of piano, piano and music theory, and is a participating member at River East Midnight Brethren Church in Winnipeg. And over to the left here is Don Herbal Boschman, pastor at Douglas Mennonite Church, having served there for the past 15 years, beginning and also going back to 1985, and to, all the way to 1996 was a missionary in Botswana, working in the area of theological education for pastors of indigenous African churches. So welcome again to all of you. I look forward to this uh, time of conversation with you and with our participants who are online. <clears throat> so I want to begin. And uh, as we begin our conversation, I would also uh, rem remind you to feel free to interrupt one another uh, or to uh, respond to something that you're hearing uh, to add something to the conversation. Um, I want to begin by just, just asking, actually, to each of you, uh, what, what's your, what would you give as a general response to the Leadership Summit event? Just a, a comment or two at the outset, and we'll come back to this at the end as we sum up, but perhaps just to begin. Cheryl, would you like to begin? Sure. One of the things I enjoyed was just listening to good orators and, and sort of thinking about what is the role in finely crafted speeches in, in terms of leadership. Um, and, and then putting that good orators in the context of what's the flow of an overall event. And, and, and I think that's uh, an interesting question for us, for us to address in terms of uh, what kind of space and participation do we have in events that feature good orators. That's why I'd like to work with that at some point here. Uh -huh. Um, I felt that the event, my, I think my initial response was that it was charismatic. <laughs> For me, coming from maybe a, a reasonably conservative Mennonite church, um, I, there was areas there where I, where I was pushed and had a little bit of discomfort and felt maybe a little bit out of place. Um, however, my overall experience, I would say, was energizing, was vibrant, 
Uh, I felt that the teachings were, um, there was a lot of value in what I picked up from the teachings. Um, and and some, some strong, well, the overall theme of leadership and how, how to be a Christ-like leader, I think, is it's maybe an overall theme that I felt was emphasized there. Thank you. Jamie? Um, I felt a little conflicted, and, and I think part of it came from being, on one hand, being a, a Mennonite pastor, uh, I would call myself a convinced Anabaptist uh, later in life, um, but also as the director of a uh, mission here, which is an evangelical charismatic Christian organization, and finding that both of those traditions, both of those values being important to me, and finding, coming into this event, some conflicted responses, both positively and negatively, because of the dynamic on both sides. And it was, it was helpful to have those two things at play, because um, I just felt like I was playing diplomat to myself. But, uh, uh, so it wasn't negative conflicted, but it was a it was definitely a dynamic tension that I found myself. That's something that we want to come back to, I'm sure, later on in some of the other comments. Thank you. Don? Uh, just before we start this podcast, our webinar, we were talking about how many opportunities we have for education, and uh, especially in a place like Winnipeg, there are lots of events, and uh, I found this a very good event, and I enjoyed the, uh, many of the speeches, and there were a lot of good ideas, uh, but then you ask yourself, okay, how many good ideas can I implement, and uh, it seems like I'm often overwhelmed with information and ideas and programs and plans and strategies, and uh, sort of seize on this is the one thing that I want to take away and just leave the rest uh, is important to me. I was thinking this morning of uh, Jesus' words at the end of the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about a lot of different things. And then he says, uh, so everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, it's like a wise man who builds himself in a rock. And you go, okay, uh, I've, I don't know how many books I've read in the last year. I don't know how many uh, speeches I've heard. But what is that one thing that I go, this is what I need, this is what our congregation needs. That, that's the challenge for me. But thanks. Well, let's, let's get a little more specific. Um, Jamie, is there anything in particular that stood out as a highlight for you? Um, I think uh, what was a highlight for me was um, uh, Patrick Lencioni's uh, focus on, on six clarifying questions. Um, the thing I like about questions is they can, they tend to be, depending on the question, but good questions tend to not be limited by context. And so I found that these questions were really helpful. And I could bring them to my inner city church community and, and ask these clarifying questions of the nature of who we were as a community, as a church. But I could also use these on a regional level as a representative of the Wildwood Western Canada leadership. That kind of that kind of resource is, is really helpful because of, given the nature of our church, some of the more uh, business-oriented material on the, the uh, which was great, has less direct application to church in mind. Jane, something from you? Sure, well I resonated also with um, with Patrick. The, the idea around a healthy organization I think translates so well across, um, you know, whether you're a religious organization or, or a general business. And so working at the, at the Winnipeg Chamber, we're a small office and we treat ourselves like a small business. And um, and I think it's so easy it's so easy to evaluate what he determines the <clears throat> the smart priorities, marketing and finance and technology and, and those things that are so easily measurable. And how do you take that to the next step and talk about what makes for a healthy organization and, and um, that that was a really uh, that had a lot of impact on me and the work that, that I do with, with my team. Uh, I, I took a number like I guess maybe this comes into my, my um, interest in social media. Like I thought, there were so many tweet-worthy comments and and, and quotes that I that I took um, from from religious ones to sort of general leadership ones. But here's just a couple. Uh, you're not a leader to respond to stuff. You're a leader to move stuff forward. And that was a Bill Hybels quote. And and I thought, yeah, so many times I get my, I find myself getting kind of dragged into weeds and getting involved in details of planning and preparation and those kinds of things. And really, what I want to be as a leader is I want to be a strategic thinker and I want to be one that's going to set direction and, and, and have that sort of following, if you will. Um, and another one uh, from Craig uh, Groeschel was, if you're not dead, 
you're not done. And sometimes I think that uh, you know we, we want to take take pauses in our leadership or 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 hiatus or breaks of things. And and it was a good reminder that you know no matter where you are, what stage of life you're in, it's important to keep moving things forward. So those were a couple of highlights for me. Don or Cheryl, what, what you said about that quote uh, from Craig Rochelle about you're not dead. Uh, you're not done if you're not. Uh, if you're not dead. Uh, what I found surprising was about two weeks ago, I was listening to a sermon by John Wartburg that he had just given at his home congregation. And he totally took that, that phrase. He says, I was at a conference, I heard this phrase, and his whole sermon, that, you know, it was nice to see the interview that the speakers were walking away uh, with good stuff from other speakers there. Um, I think for me, um, I, I resonated with Patrick Lencioni's questions as well, and I think as staff, that's the one thing that we're going to take away together as a staff at our congregation is that we're going to work through these, kind of, these questions and then work with council on those questions. Um, I think as personally, uh, I think uh, Bill Heibel's comments about the privilege of being a leader, and uh, it is easy to get into, as he said, a crying session about, oh, I got it so tough, or all these responsibilities, or I need to you know, put out that fire, or whatever, and just to remember how lucky we are uh, to be called to lead organizations. That's um, something I'll remind myself very right early on. I'll highlight uh, three speakers. Um, first of all, two of the testimonial style ones. Uh, Pranitha, um, I thought was just profound, and at her comment, God, or something to the effect that God destroyed the crowd so it could no longer work in news, um, was something that, in a way, I found to be in tension with the overall event, which would be interesting to interrogate. Uh, but without being critical there, to, to actually think in your own context, uh, where are you too sure of yourself in rallying up everyone around it, and, and where is God actually part of the fireworks? And, and, and what, how do you not just try to manage that, but how do you actually um, do well to respond to those places where God is destroying the crowd? And, and the way that she could work that, I just found that really profound to motivate. Uh, second was Carly. Uh, actually, uh, well, well, her whole testimony was incredibly moving. Um, I'm going to highlight something from the interview, which was from five years earlier. This whole notion of the need to deliberate in confidence uh, so that you can be then transparent and open in your operations and so on. And, and that this deliberating in confidence uh, there needs to be space for that so that we really can address the stuff that is most divisive and most complex and, and where we can develop enough trust to take those questions further that we can then, you know, move into different contexts. And um, in any case, uh, the way she told that wasn't some blip, we're just going to close the door and try to work this out without, without the newspaper getting on our backs. It was more a matter of, we are going to find our way into greater levels of honesty to work at things. And, and, and for someone who's been a leader on that level, and, and I realized I just found that profound and, and, and really very free. Um, and then, and then the third one that I want to, to highlight is a comment that uh, Jim made to Collins, and that was, who would miss you if you disappeared? And, and, and that one in the context of, I, again, this whole question of where is the church trying to find how it survives, and where is it so sort of too sure of itself or struggling of what it is, and just to, to answer that question, like, who would miss you if you, you know, it's, it's the old, uh, what's the Christmas movie that word? Anyway, wonderful life, right? <laughs> so it's not a new theme to any of us. But uh, but I think that that's a really profound question to end with. Um, and so that's when I that's a huge highlight, and I think I think we'll we'll do a lot of good for for us in different contexts.
that I think connects so well too to the Mark Gilberger piece about um, ask ask kids what they want to do for their legacy. Yeah. Right. Right. So right. those two kind of tie in together. Thank you. Um, each of you comes from a different kind of leadership field. We have uh, sort of more uh, calls your congregation more traditional or more contempt more usual. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jane, you're from a more alternative, <laughs> unusual congregation. Uh, you're leading in a university setting, Cheryl, and you're leading in a more public setting in the Chamber of Commerce. Were there things that you thought or found really connected in a particular way to your field of leadership? Uh, you have a thought on that, Christine? Um, well, maybe I can respond as a, can I say this, young leader? Do I still call them? <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, I definitely feel like a leader in training. That's that's how I feel. And though I have a team that I lead, and though I'm involved in, a, in an organization that is certainly a, a leader in, in our community, um, for me, I think, that just having some, some fundamental ideas around leadership and putting leadership into practice and how to lead was, was really valuable. So that kind of answer the question, Mike? I, I think so, yeah. Um, is, would, there, would there be a particular interface of the, the overall faith perspective of the event? I know that not all the speakers necessarily claim to be personal faith. Is there something about the faith dimension that was evident in the event translates to where you work? Well, I guess ultimately, um, being a, a leader that is a Christian, the way that I've, the way that I've been raised and sort of what the imprint is on me um, is the foundation that my parents put on me, right, as, as, a, as a child. And, and so the, some of those things were um, the golden rule. Do to others what you would want them to do. And for me, that is to be a Christ-centered leader. Um, so there's some stories that uh, my sister-in-law, for example, was uh, was attended the, the summit as well. And her in her work, um, she works at the Salem Home in Winkler, which is a personal care home. And they've totally reevaluated how they lead and how they work their company um, because of the experiences that they've had uh, at the summit. And uh, and to provide Christ-centered care is is their new philosophy, and, it, and it's now what they do. And they're seeing you know. Residents are living longer, they're on less medications, um, and overall, sort of the mood is, and if she's happier, they're seeing results. So I think um, those are things that I will aspire to, like the, the, the learnings and things I will I will take and, and sort of form a goal and, and, and see how it, what, what comes from it. Just have a brief comment here from Craig, who's joining us uh, online, and, and he says to Christine, if you have to ask, if you're a young leader, you probably aren't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Any other responses to that interface between uh, your area of leadership and what you experienced in the summit? Well, I, I mean, kind of appreciating what, what you just said. I, I think it's so important that when we talk about Christian leadership, we recognize a little more nuanced sometimes than, um, uh, for example, those who are familiar with what our current police chief is dealing with in the news right now. You know, it. You should explain that because um, people are looking for. Yeah, he, he, he did an interview with the Christian uh, uh, news media and talked about calling Christians to to pray for peace in the city. And then, um, whether his his words were represented well by the paper or not, I into that, but it started a firestorm of criticism of people you know, talking about the lines of his role as a civic leader and his religious beliefs and keeping them separate. And I think sometimes we, we confuse what it means to be a Christian leader in a kind of an external way of, of putting it out there that rather than allowing it to be a Christ-centered leadership which shapes how we function regardless of the context. So I think, I think that's really critical. Those of you who may only be listening and not seeing an image, this was, that was Jamie speaking. Um, do you want to add something to that, Don? Um, I found the story that he told about the race for the South Pole very compelling, and about especially in breaking down uh, Ronald Atkinson, breaking down his journey into these 20-mile increments, and just saying I'm going to be very, very methodical about going for my goal in 20-mile increments, and not racing, uh, sprinting, or not uh, giving myself excuses why this particular day is a tough day. And uh, he called it uh, smack, specific, measurable, uh, and consistent, like in our progress. And I was thinking about some of the um, past.
pastors that I know who I really admire who have done really wonderful things in a specific area. And as I've gotten to know them, they do follow that SMAC principle, specific, measurable, and consistent. I think of like a John Newfeld who was at First Mennonite for many years and was well known for his preaching. And hearing, being in a class where he was teaching preaching and saying that he was always working on three sermons at a time. Like he started three weeks out, this is what I did the first week, this is what I did the second week, this is what I did the third week. And I think too many of us are Wednesday, Thursday, Friday uh, pastors who prepare on those days. But he was specific and he had these targets that he had. Or uh, Harold Peters Franzen, he's an interim pastor who's been at like fair sized congregations like First Mennonite, like uh, now he's at North Kildonan. And within six months, he visits almost everyone. Because he just says, I'm going to do two visits a day, you know, and just take them off the list because that's what's important to him. And do I have my thing that I'm specific and consistent and saying, I'm just going to work away at this in small chunks day after day after day and after a year or two, I'll call it maybe even process. Yeah, it raises that question, what is that thing for a leader? You know, regardless of where you are, what is that one thing that you do because you're committed to that? That's the baseline that well, I think that's where Bill Hybel's six by six principle is saying those things will change from time to time. But you would need to be very intentional about picking what is this goal for the next six week first or uh, perhaps longer. Yeah, I couldn't concur more about uh, discipline practice and, and so on. But I'm going to go on to something else. And um, whether this was really directly what people were saying, it's certainly um, what struck me. And, and that is how we engage large-scale media and tech as effective ways of interacting with the gospel in places where we are strongly committed to holistic understandings of life and not separating out the intellectual and the sort of the, the compelling visionary work from the practicalities, from the relationships with people and, and, and from the uh, just engaging in all of life. And, and, but what struck me, actually, was this notion that Jesus spoke to unusually large crowds in his time, right? And so, just how do we work through what these new capabilities are, including the kind of conversation that we're part of today in this webinar, in terms of how we don't just resist because something is not going to be holistic the way we've defined it in the past, but how do we take that commitment to holism through what this new medium is for us and and, and for us to, to, to work hard at that. The other is this whole notion of, of speaking persuasively. These, and, and we've experienced two forms of persuasion. I, I spoke at the beginning there in terms of good orators. And whether or not I agreed, I found them, to most, for the most part, to be persuasive. The, you know, Mark and a few others were, you know, a little over-the-top excited. Intense. Intense. <laughs> but, but, but it came from a place that that's what he was fully living. And they all felt that way. But the framing of the event, the conversations that happened in between, or, or the way we were led between the, between the speakers, was much more earnest and direct in this kind of gesturing and so on. And so that struggle of what kind of persuasiveness and holding back, and how persuaded I was actually by these orators who didn't try to do this to me or force me into something, and yet feeling like the event was taking me there. And so, so that's where I was, you know, this notion of how we work forward with leaders with these things was in how I look at those questions. It really calls for a lot of self-awareness in terms of what, what's, the, what's the effect of a persuasive approach when the content may not, may not be right. in itself persuasive. Yeah, like how is it I could sit there and listen to her for a long time, whether or not I agree with much of what she says at all, because she knows how to present herself, you know? And so that's a very interesting thing to do. And, and we, other than a little bit of humor, uh, in at least Mennonite preaching, we, we don't use a lot of emotion. Uh, that, that We say things that we feel quite passionately about, about, but we say it in a very dispassionate way. And so I think... Um, our body language and our tone of voice in some ways belies our message that we're, we're, we say, 
this is the most important thing in the world, as if it were selling pizza or something like this. And uh, I was speaking to a, a young adult uh, very recently, and she was talking about uh, a significant change in her life, about how uh, her relationship with Jesus just went to a very deep level. And, she, and it was the result of someone speaking to a group of students uh, who started to weep as they talked about how much they wanted these students to love Jesus. And she said, no one has ever cried about my relationship with, with Jesus before, you know? And when she saw that, how much it meant to that speaker, you know, it, it didn't just touch her head, it touched her heart, you know? And uh, I think that is something certainly I can uh, think about and push myself uh, to not have my demeanor and my message be at cross purposes with each other. If I can just respond to that, uh, I fully agree with what you're saying here. I also want us to note, though, that most of these speakers weren't going for the emotional fun. No. They were several steps of performance beyond that. That they were allowing us to enter into something yeah. that they knew how to pace things, they knew how to pull things out and all that kind of stuff, but it wasn't going for the emotional manipulation. No, I don't know. No, 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 no. And, and I'm not saying yeah. you are, but it was just yeah. very interesting to see the level of... of I want to shift just a little bit now, and, and this, this next was actually a group of three questions that I think are related, and I'm going to ask you to respond to them kind of as a whole. Um, as an Anabaptist leader, what was in a particular value in the summit, if you think through that lens? And were there points of tension with your understandings as an Anabaptist leader? Were there things that kind of graded or you rubbed up against and said, I'm not sure how this fits? Um, and perhaps you could also think about what does an Anabaptist approach to leadership add to what you might not have received there, but, you know, a particular area or way of leading was perhaps spoken to when you said, you know, as Anabaptists, we can, we can fill this out or we can add something to this that, that completes it or critiques it. Um, Jamie, you, you want to begin? Um, well, I can start with the things that were attention. Um, and and, I, and I, I respond in kind of, it's funny that I go first because I've probably been an Anabaptist for the least amount of time as anyone around this table, you know. Um, and I came to Anabaptists by a, a Catholic saint, St. Francis, which is a strange journey. And my church that I pastor um, has only two people in it who would identify as you know, cultural Mennonites. Uh, and so um, <laughs> the enthusiastic emotional stuff that you say isn't present, come to my church. <laughs> we have it in spades. Um, but the tension I found was, um, and, and perhaps it's the advantage of being uh, a convert to the tradition, is that um, we have just assumed as natural things like a uh, commitment to a you know, multi-voice church, to a community hermeneutic, to, to um, leadership functioning more as um, multifaceted expressions of different people's gifts working in mutuality together. Uh, and, and, um, Tempting intentionally not to. Well, there are circumstances where where certain leadership roles and giftings require more um, authority. Uh, we are really intentional about not privileging those uh, those giftings inherently. It, it's part of our, our defining language as a church that we, we we attempt to not privilege certain giftings over others. Um, um, but that said, then coming into this, where uh, some of the some of the language of, of even the gift of leadership, that language of the gift of leadership, um, I struggled with that. It's not that I don't feel that there are gifted uh, leaders, uh, but rather that it presupposes um, a hierarchy that is um, a fixed reality. Uh, and, and so that, that I really struggled with. And, and, and I'm not, I, I, I also resisting the other extreme, which is quite popular in some circles today, where we attempt to resist that hierarchy by creating leaderless organizations, which in principle sound great, but functionally we, we actually do away with the giftings. So that was the, the, that was the major tension I felt um, going into this, because there are people in, in the Flowers community, my church, who will never will never, honestly, will never appreciate the kind of content that we've got at an event like this. We'll 
never have a what we stereotype as a front and center leadership position and yet function in incredible leadership. And I'm not saying that in that kind of condescending way. Everyone's a leader in their own way. No, like genuinely being a leader in what it means to be Christ-like leaders. I want to find. I want. I, I would resist anything that would reduce that. Say that was my greatest tension. So there was, there was kind of an assumption behind a lot of the presentation that that sort of rubs up against that way of cultivating leadership, what you just described. Yeah. Except it, it wasn't called uh, the church summit; it was called the leadership summit. So I, I, I think I think that's why it focused on 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 certain leadership traits and attributes because that's who they were pitching it for. If you see yourself as a leader, someone who other people are following, then this is uh, a resource for you, rather than just saying, this is a spiritual gifts uh, uh, summit, where we're, we're, we're trying to discern the gifts of the church and stuff like that. So I, I felt it was okay, in some ways, to focus on certain leadership gifts, and not say, these are the only gifts that um, the, the church needs, like you talked about Prinata's uh, uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying her, her name right, uh, the speech, you know. In, in that sense, it was saying, you know, that these gifts of compassion and mercy and justice are, 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 are vitally important to the church. The church isn't just about cultivating leaders. But um, I think it, like Jim Collins in his earlier book, he said when he started looking at these good to great companies and saying what brought them out, he said he was very, very resistant to the idea that leaders made such a huge difference to these companies. He said, surely there are some other factors. And so when all the data started coming in, and he was going, oh gosh, leaders are really, really important. You know, and it was discouraging to him because he really didn't want to buy into this sort of great leader uh, theology. But then what he found out was that the leaders that truly made a difference weren't the kinds of, like the Iacocas who, who had these oversized egos and oversized personalities. But he talked about you know, these level five leaders who were truly humble truly committed and stuff like that. So maybe the leaders that we saw up front, other than this uh, Prenath and Timothy, had these sort of stereotypical leadership gifts with these larger than life personalities. Uh, but uh, I, I think... Yeah. It's really I guess it's because it was... I, I agree, but I guess it was because it was implicit in the lineup and yeah. I'm not qualified. Yeah, I think, I think it just would have benefited from some qualification. I can step into that. Sure. I I struggled with the same thing because I think we're often too simplistic with our notion of priesthood and model leaders and, and don't realize that, that there are specific people that need to be leaders within that. However, I would have appreciated more nuancing between the difference of leadership provided by leaders and leadership that emerges from a process that's not directed by a particular person called a leader. And I think that that's a nuancing that the Anabaptist tradition has to offer, that the notion of leadership is something that we can hear as being called out through a much more collaborative process. And, and that I didn't find it to be acknowledged at all. Leadership is because there are leaders, rather than leadership is leadership in the world through the church might not be leaders in terms of people, or at least not at the forefront. And and, and I think to work with that would, would be something that is really valuable for our friend to do. Yeah. Do you want to add anything to this points of tension, points of resonance on an Anabaptist perspective, Christine? Um, well, let me pick up on one thing that one person said, and perhaps this is taking everything out of context and we don't need to go any further in the conversation, but um, thinking critically as I was sitting there and kind of trying to absorb everything in, uh, something stuck out in my, in, in my uh, mind, uh, and it was again from Craig uh, Grishel. He kind of opened up his talk about how Think of the uh, Disney, um, it's a small world after all. He kind of went on this big thing about how how great it all is and and that um, um, uh, he posed the question, what brings what is it that brings people of all walks of life together other than Jesus? And well, that's a lovely thing to say. I also thought in my head, what divides people more? Than, than religion. 
religion and Christianity. And um, so I'll, I'll leave that here because maybe we don't want to go there, but if that was something for me that was that was a big before we uh, go, so you know, well, I know, the other know. thing is, and this has been, I, this may be my sixth or seventh leadership summit that I've attended, and it seems to be a consistent pattern. Um, they try and bring in not just persuasive speakers, but quote, people who are a big success. And, and the way they define success when it comes to pastors is growing a big church. And, and yeah, and so uh, I don't know if I've ever heard a, a talk there by someone who has a congregation of 50 or 100, 150, and say, how, how do we have a healthy, effective congregation of 100, 150, uh, and, and hold that person up as a very, very effective leader? Are you not being Yeah. No, no, that's a really interesting point. It's one of the notes that I have made to myself, too, thinking of all of this, yes, a certain style of being church is being presumed uh, that you're, you're in a First of all, you're located uh, socially and demographically in a place where there's in you know an ex inexhaustible supply of people that could be a focus of outreach and invitation. And then I ask myself, so if you're in rural Saskatchewan or Montana and you have 35 people coming and they're faithful, how do these things translate to that kind of leadership setting? And how do you talk yeah. about leadership together in the way that you were, Cheryl, um, as a community? How do those things emerge as a community? Very much. And if I can just sort of move that in a, in a slightly different direction, too. Uh, this notion that Lencioni was talking about, about being smart and healthy. I think that the Anabaptist tradition actually has something to say that doesn't even separate those two. You know, that there's something that can be so holistic that it's not possible to think of anything being smart. Right, so that you know yeah. that that that's just there, and and that such and I like the word healthy as well because it means something different than, than the word success. Yes, healthy and effective, I think, are, are very different words, and so and so to use those words, healthy and effective, and um, without a success that's measured against being better than somebody else. I'm going to give you just a chance for a, for a final comment here on the panel before we go to questions from our online participants. Anything else you'd like to add in terms of an overall comment, something you were itching to say before and didn't get a chance because we moved on? I have a question for the other participants, as again, as the, I'm just, how did you respond, and just to person you don't have that, but how did you respond or feel about the style of using worship? Because I was sitting with a few people from the conference, and that was a significant tension for them. And I wondered if that was just unique to them, or if that was part of the culture. That was uncomfortable. Okay. Can you say a little bit more about that? What, what, what was, I, mean, I was not at the Winnipeg event, so I experienced a different music leadership. It might, be, it might have been the same style, but what was, what was the point of discomfort? Um, well, I think the intention of, of singing together is meant to feel like you're in something together. And I, when I, when I can't follow, uh, when I don't know the songs or know the music, or then, I, then I don't feel like I'm part of that community. I feel like, oh, everybody knows this but me, and oh, I don't belong. That's sort of the feeling that I have. For me, it was. Um uh, I had many of the same feelings, and, I, and I, I've often wondered um, why that one particular style of music is always at the, at the leadership summit, and because um, the people who attend the leadership summit are, are drawn from a, a wide variety of churches, and it just seems that it's usually a misreading of the congregation or the audience who are there to say, oh, we are all from one particular kind of church, and we will do this one particular kind of music. When, when, because when you look around the room, um, you know, at least from where I was sitting, two-thirds of the people were not singing many of those songs. And I just feel like, why do they persistently, year after year after year, misread the audience? Or are they trying to send a message to the audience um, that this is the kind of church that we should all move to? I struggled. Um, and I will say that 
evenly at the same time, I, I really, really struggle with all the stereotypes that go around the people that are either sort of musicians by trade or not. And so um, I really tried to, well, I tried to try it on, right, and to just copy the gesture and do it. But if I'm singing that low in my range, I just feel like I'm groaning and lamenting and chanting and that it's not singing. And and there I actually found a place to something positive that that our whole culture is trying to sing together, but we're just groaning because we know we can't. And yet, uh, I'm not sure that many would, sh I mean, maybe this group would, but but others would think I'm being an arrogant musician if I say that we're groaning and kind of singing we're doing and that we're lamenting the fact that there isn't a unison that we can sing. And, and this is not in any way an anti-band, anti-rock, but, but it, bands and rocks are, are highly skilled traditions that are produced. And we have not yet well translated that into the congregational voice. And I'm putting myself into that because I'm willing to become a part of something that says there's something that connects with people. It's not the only thing, but bands and rock bands and so forth, they connect with people. But to say that they, we have found our way to take this highly produced sort of wonderful art form and turn it into something that suits the congregational voice. I think we're still at a lamenting, chanting, finding our way stage. And and I'm willing to accept that if we're willing to at least enter into that thought. Thank you. Let's let's go to our um, participants from online and uh, hear some of your questions. <laughs> okay, uh, and, and people who can't see me, it's Dan Dick here. I'm helping Dave moderate the questions here. Uh, so we just have a comment that came in um, from Kirsten Schroer. Personally, I enjoy this music and don't get a chance to hear it in my church. I think that the church that hosts usually produces the music they are best able to produce. That's fine. Sir. We have the mics on or off right now, Richard. I don't know if anyone's trying to respond uh, through audio. Are there any, any other questions that any, anyone want to raise their hand and, and uh, text a question to us? Or comments. Or comments. Do you want to add something to something you heard earlier? observation um, it was it was significant to me and it raises questions to me about how we lead from within the church and how we perceive ourselves in the church as well um, while I had you know, a, a range of responses to the style the content and so on and even the kind of leadership models that were being held for or at least by implication as, as being ideal um, one of the things that I noted and you you know this before Don uh, that um, there wasn't an assumption that all who were there were in church leadership. They were leaders. And it was clear to me that this large organization, the Willow Creek organization, sees a part of their mission as reaching out to people who are leading in our social structures, whether they're affiliated with the faith community or not. And I found that an interesting and a very challenging thought. And I asked myself, how do we in our Anabaptist, our Mennonite settings, think about ourselves? When we talk with training leaders or um, enabling people to do what they do best, are we thinking of that in fact as tools for an additional tool to connect with our communities? Or are we, are we think of leadership as something internal? Yeah. And that's what we do here, and then we call people to faith, but we're not thinking of their other skills and gifts and so on. Don, you're... No, I mean, 
Uh, my wife was there because the organization that she works with, a hospital, um, I think there were eight people from the hospital there, and uh, she had been to a summit uh, some years ago, and then she had told her CEO, you know, this is a really good thing, and she had shown him some of the DVDs, and then he, he said, yeah, I want to be part of this. And, uh, so uh, she, she came back and she said, Don, you really need to get more people other than just church staff at something like this, because there are um, areas of application to um, to their own businesses uh, that um, they, the church can be a resource to them, not just what they do for the church, but what, what they do uh, for the majority of, of their time during the day. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I suppose I just don't think often enough in that way. Well, it's one of the things that we talked about before we got going here, right, is that, that when you're in the business world, um, there are opportunities for leadership development and training all over. And I thought it was, I thought it was great to, for, for somebody who's in that sort of business realm to participate in leadership development for, for uh, church leaders or, or Christian leaders in general. So I thought that was really valuable. You know, when, I think it's valuable. I want to tie this back to what I said earlier in terms of leadership emerging. And and so I was sort of um, considering uh, how are we then addressing how the leadership that the church provides within society coincides with the leadership that all kinds of different agencies and businesses provide and sort of how do, you know, if we're working with different, or with the same assumptions in terms of what the leaders are after, how is the leadership of these different agencies, bodies, what have you, within society working together or not? And I think we're sort of laying the groundwork to get there. Uh, but we're not nearly there when we're concentrating on the people just doing what the mission of that organization has to be. It's just what is the leadership of all these organizations in 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 the health of in the health of our world and in the healing of our world. And you know And that's a very church churchly question. That's a churchly question. And yet I think to ask it not only in terms of well how's the church leading, but how is that churchly question one that can be refined and and pushed and challenged from things from organizations that aren't the church and how is that churchly question actually the same kind of question businesses are trying to ask when they're trying to go about their business and address ethical concerns and sustainable environment and all those good treatment of people and so how is that churchly question sort of either resistered or more most helpfully asked in that context in terms of the leadership of what these organizations are doing. So it's not just the health of these organizations, but how is the power of all these organizations both the health and healing of the world? That is probably for me the most important thing that, that Anabaptists could bring into that conversation uh, and that I'd love to see happen in this context. Christine, I wonder if I can put you on the spot a little bit. You're the one among these four panelists that works in a more public setting. How does that, how does, how does Cheryl's comments resonate for you? Um, the larger role of leadership, bringing a healthier, more holistic world to be. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective. And as Cheryl was talking, I was thinking, like, how do, how do we as a church identify leaders? Well, we look at people, we look at their careers, and we think, oh, that person has kind of a leadership position in their company, and so surely they could read scripture, read scripture or whatever, right? So, um, but um, that leadership development is a very interesting dynamic, and, and I think often in the church we focus on developing um, youth leaders and exploring gifts among our young people and that sort of thing, and, and maybe that needs to be broadened, and maybe there's that untraditional, I think uh, Jane talked about it earlier, um, that untraditional uh, role that is very much leadership. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how well I read yeah. that. We have two questions. Two questions. Um, want to go to William Lowen's question first? Uh, William, 
Jim uh, says, I was particularly engaged by John Ortberg's talk, but I think he often confused the influence of Jesus in the church with the influence of empire and institutions. I'd be interested to hear what others thought of this. Jamie is itching to respond. Jamie, do you have a response to that? And I'd urge other participants online to uh, consider the question, too. Well, I just, I just found that was a, another point where um, I found myself in tension because uh, he, he was a fantastic orator, and he was, and, and coming from a, a, a more rural evangelical background myself, he was actually very generous in his inclusion of, of uh, certain figures and movements in history. I grew up, he wouldn't mention, you know, Catholics. So um, it was very inspiring. But at the same time, as he was, he was um, talking about Jesus being King of King, Lord of Lords, the, the hinge of history, and then naming these historical movements, it was unqualified. It was uncritically. Uh, not, I'm not saying he assumed, because I think if you asked him, I think he probably would, would say it. But I think for some of the listeners, it might have been assumed that some of the historical works of the church. Um, have been the work of God and not necessarily recognize that there has been empire um, at, at play in that. And, um, you know, and, uh, we were talking earlier before that, that began, the fact that he shared the stage uh, that over those two days with Condoleezza Rice suggests an implicit assumption about the nature of leadership, the nature of Christian leadership. And uh, whether it was an intended message or not, it, I think it was still implicit there. It, it, it made me very, it made me constantly want to get up and say, yes, but, you know, um, so yeah. My wife's reaction was, has he really traveled or lived in other parts of the world? Like, it's built as a global leadership summit, so there's people from all over the world uh, listening to this. And I'm a big John Ortberg fan. I, I try and listen to his sermons most, most weeks. It's just a way to nourish my own soul. But um, this idea that Jesus brought compassion into the world. He's brought education into the world. And, and, and you can just, a Chinese Christian going, our, our culture was not shaped significantly by the Western uh, uh, tradition. Uh, and we didn't have education in a, in a major way in our, our, uh, in our civilization. We didn't have compassion. It, it just seemed like a very narrow Western reading of history. Uh, to pursue this a little further, more we have at least another one more question waiting. But um, you mentioned actually before we begin. So you mentioned this word. You said like you'd like to talk about the nature of being global in this leadership event. And I think Don, you're touching on some of that. Shirley, you want to say a little more about what you were hinting at there? Sure. Um, I mean, I think Mennonite Church is really intentional and in really working out what does it mean to be. Church to be to think in terms of a global Anabaptist church, and and I wonder if that's the same thing as what's meant from by a global leadership summit. And it strikes me that this was a little bit more of here's an umbrella and we'll take it everywhere else, whereas the global Anabaptist church is much more starting to be it's a lot more Mennonites in Africa than there are in North America. So you know how does that inform what this church becomes, and so, and and I don't, but I don't want to do that to just pat ourselves on the back. It's just to really struggle with what that word global means is is something that that struck me there. I think rather than the net global, that we will take this out globally. We will run this event globally rather than we will uh, let the global church have influence right. on this event and and shape the kind of speakers that they think we in the like. We're saying we in the West think the world needs to hear these kind of speakers rather than, I mean, it'd be very different if you got a, a panel of African and Asian leaders and South American leaders saying, you know, most of the people who are, who are listening to this are, are either North Americans, they're Westerners. This is what they really need to hear. And so we will pick the speakers, we'll pick the themes for half the Global Leadership Summit. Well, and what's interesting, too, is that the whole theme really came, came uh, to this, this uh, slogan of the local church is the whole
we even do with food. And, and um, so let's start with giving voice to that, and then let's go about what's our 20 mile today right? <laughs> of, of giving voice to that humility. The, the, the thing that worries me about that, and I, I know it's not intentional, uh, but is, is the fact that like when, when we have done relief work with some students in different parts of the world, it, because a lot of this kind of global quote unquote event is exported, uh, it is not uncommon for Christians in, in different nations to presume that, that the health of their church is to become like that which we've exported to them. Um, we've been to, to places in, in um, Uganda devastated by the internal war there. Uh, people who've been feeding orphans out of their own pocket, you know, like just like just incredible Christians that just and, and we're sending a group of um, 19, 20 year olds for a period of time to do some relief work. And they're like, oh, can your can your students disciple our staff? And we were just like, your staff disciple our students. And it was it, we ended up ending that partnership with that organization because they couldn't wrap their mind around that they would have anything of value to give to us or that we um, Connected to that was something that I, as, as I was in the event, I sent an email off to a couple of friends in Seattle who were part of a, a group called the Church Collective. And I said, wouldn't it be great if you could have this parish leadership summits all over the world? You know, uh, the, the dissonance of having the local church being constantly, and yet the word neighborhood, I think, was mentioned once, and that was when Bill Hubbles was talking about the Catholic on the scene of the church property. Um, uh, and that, that concerned me a little bit, you know, the sense of context being lost. Let's go to the other question. Uh, sure, we have uh, Ruth Bean here, and I think a lot of your most recent conversation here is touching on, on her question. I'm going to uh, answer her last question first here. Uh, she asked, is there anyone participating in the MC Canada webinar who is not from North America? And the answer to that is, to the best of my knowledge, no. Uh, in fact, I don't even know if anyone from outside of Canada is participating. So now I'll read the rest of her, her question. Uh, she writes, it was billed as a global leadership summit. I was intrigued that only one voice was not from North America. What would this event look like if it was a global summit? As part of the Mennonite Church and having served overseas, I am aware that we are enculturated leaders who can learn from each other. This was a valuable resource for me as a Canadian leader. What could we learn from non-North American leaders? What do we have to offer? When I was um, 25 years old, Mennonite Church Canada sent me to Botswana to train pastors uh, because the indigenous churches there in Botswana had asked for help from Mennonites to train their local pastors. Um, and most of the pastors there were in, uh, 55 plus. They would be what we would call lay ministers uh, and lay bishops. They had their other uh, jobs to support them. And uh, I had a, a good seminary education, but I had literally zero uh, congregational experience. I had never worked full time in a congregation. And one of the things I appreciated there was um, these indigenous African churches was the limited help they asked. They, uh, they didn't ask me pastoral uh, care questions. They didn't ask me to teach seminars on pastoral care. They didn't ask me to teach leadership courses. They just said, you know the Bible better than we do in, in a factual sort of way. You know the history of Israel and the history of the early church. Teach us that. And we had that was a gift I could bring because I had a good education. But they also said, here's a 25-year-old, read between the ears. Uh, so we're not going to ask them how, what we should do about polygamy or, uh, you know, uh, uh, church discipline and stuff like this. And they had no problem, um, at, because I was young and they respect age, uh, bossing me around uh, in some ways. I remember uh, an African bishop, uh, I went to an installation uh, service of uh, a new pastor who was moving into our community. And right in the installation service, he said, and this new pastor will be living with Dawn. Um, and he had never asked me if this pastor could live with me. But he knew I had an extra bedroom, and because he was a bishop, and I was a 25-year-old single man, he could do that, you know? And, and so I think we do have um, strong church leaders who can set the agenda for the North American church, when they recognize the North American church is gifted in this. They're not gifted in knowing how to cast out evil spirits. We're not going to ask them, how do you cast out an evil spirit? 
And if they want to know, they can ask us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, I mean, those comments, I think, are, are a great addition to the earlier observations being made here. That what, what, when we think as Mennonite churches and Baptist faith communities, what does it mean to be global? We're thinking much more in those terms. That there's, a, there's a relationship um, where we receive as well as offer. And we ask, what is it that you have to bring? Uh, and you offer that to each other. Yes. We have one more question here, Dave, from uh, Mel Letkeman. Uh, he says, we have acknowledged that the Mennonite Church Manitoba and the Mennonite Church Canada are not growing, at least numeric <coughs> churches. We're not, by and large, young. We know that it's not only we who face these realities, it's a Canadian reality for many churches. What did you hear about leadership at the summit that you feel would help us address this reality as Mennonite Church leaders? I ask the panelists to each to respond to that, actually. Um, Jamie, why don't you start? The <laughs> American coming from the smallest church, but also coming probably from the church that is youngest church, I mean, I'm in the 30s, I'm the third oldest church. Um, I think, I think, again, I, I, I've got a tension there because as I was listening to a lot of this, there were some, um, there were times, I actually made a note of it in my notes, I was saying where there were moments where I was genuinely tempted <laughs> to adopt certain approaches to church growth that I knew from what they were saying would be successful, and it would be, and it probably, in and of itself, it would be good, right? But it wouldn't be what God had called us to. And so in that sense, I heard some things that uh, I would, I would want to be, if, if, a, if the Mennonite Church in Canada was, was looking to these leadership summits to answer the question of church growth, I would say we need to be incredibly careful and critical about how we did that. I think there is value there. Um, perhaps the greatest value is if our churches become healthy organizations, they're more likely to be. Uh, there, were the, the, the whole, there was a quote about the healthy organizations, and I think it was uh, the healthy organizations Perhaps that would be the thing that I would say would be the best thing that drew away from the world. Sure. Well, uh, you, but I, but I will try. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Talking about small churches. Just, uh, or steady. Well, while you're thinking, I'll, 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 I'll Churches in homeostasis. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, as I sat through this summit and, and previous summits, um, I've been wondering about the nature of ambition. And uh, some people are happy with the status quo. Some people are saying things need to change. And I, I think I can change things. Um, and in our congregation, we have some very ambitious people. Um, however, they typically um, are not either recruited or respond to the call to you channel that ambition um, into the church. And so we have some uh, business leaders uh, or people who are passionate about science and research and stuff like this. And, and, and they say, I, I'm thinking big. Um, you're uh, relatively rare in the Mennonite church in the sense that you you saw something that wasn't there, and you said, I will create something new, you know, and I, it's, it's going to be a new model. I am going to tinker with this, uh, but I will, I will create something new. I think one of the problems is um, that is a rare gift among um, Mennonite clergy, is to say, I want to create something new. Is, is too often we are, I want to maintain and maybe make things healthier. And sometimes I think, a health, I, love, I love church health. I think it's great um, uh, language. But sometimes it allows us to say, well, the place is healthy, but we don't have any dreams beyond getting into that healthy spot. And what, what I find uh, interesting is you have a Mark Kielberger who, who dreams about starting a movement. Um, and, um, and that, uh, I think, um, 
not everyone dreams about starting a movement, but too few of our leaders um, are, are uh, wide awake at night dreaming about starting a movement. Um, we, we dream about other things. And I, I wonder um, what it is about our MC Canada culture that doesn't call or support the dreamers uh, to become congregational leaders. And so they dream about other things. Well, a takeoff from that, I think, is in the business world, uh, businesses, in order to succeed and grow and, and thrive, have to innovate. They cannot stay stagnant. They can't continue to make the same thing they've always made. Because if they do that eventually, whether it's in five years or, or 50 years, Thing won't be needed. It'll be replaced by something. So then, how does that make sense in terms of church? What what's happening within the Mennonite church context that is causing churches to innovate and grow and become something different that meets those different needs? Because I think society is also changing and evolving. Um, the courage to be bold uh, is what struck me, in and I think. I, and to be bold in a particular way. There's lots of ways in which the Mennonite Church is bold. But, but bold in the conversation um, with these partners, like the fact that we were part of this, this leadership summit, and, and to be bold conversation partners in there, I think, I think we have to. I think we would be sort of missing an opportunity that's there if, if we say, well, it's not quite us, and then sort of go off in our on our own side, but rather to say, this is of critical importance and it's a big component in our society, and, and we need to be part of that conversation, including claiming that we're Christian, right? You know, and then and then. And then. But some of what you were saying, what you talked about bold leadership. You talked about you know, sort of the, the, having the dream to start something new. Uh, I, th I think you're right that at least among the Mennonite Church world that I know. Uh, North, seeking more North American, obviously. Um, I think I, I put another word to that, which is, which is more associated with the business world, which is uh, the entrepreneur. Yeah. Like we, you know, there, there's a sense that there's entrepreneurial leadership that has a role uh, as we think about what the church can bring and how the church can can live, be the church. Um, but was this an event that that sort of put that foot, foot forward first, or? Well, I'd like to ask a question of Cheryl because uh, this is an MC Canada uh, webinar, uh, but you have um, your membership in the MB Church and, and you um, uh, serve in an organization that has um, support from both MC Canada and the, and the Mennonite Brother Church. Um, when you look at the um, the kind of students who are dreaming of becoming pastors at CMU who come from MC Canada and the kind of pastors who are, are dreaming about the kind of students who are dreaming about becoming pastors from the MB world. Do you notice that does the MB world foster that sort of entrepreneurial culture among its pastors in a, in a different way than MC Canada does? It's a complex uh, question to answer here because um, because the MB the world in some ways its pockets are more okay. diversified and so I would say that the students who are at CMU I mean sure they relate to the places they've come from but they're in such close interaction with one another that they're they're moving into some emerging Anabaptist thing that we don't yet imagine what it is and and the question is how how do we best interact within this Anabaptist Thing that the, the you know and it's not only Anabaptist but that's that's one way way to name it um, with, with our students here. I think for me coming back to this entrepreneurial question and this hopefully we'll get to your question there. It's I I struggle to put good language of entrepreneurs and good language of seasonal cycles in, and to think of growth as something that is also part of letting things mature, letting things be harvested, letting things winter, naming all those things, and then inserting, in what places are you inserting yourself into all parts of those? Because clearly we need to cultivate and take part, care of all of those, and, um, 
and yet in some ways to watch them happen and let them happen. And, and I think that, that that boldness of naming all of those parts and the entrepreneurial part is part of what you're planting. And it's part of what you're actually uh, working with and, and harvesting in sense and allowing to winter and naming what you're allowing to winter. And that, that yeah. might mean, you know, and so I think we're stuck in either there are things we have to preserve or there are things that have to be growing and be spring all the time. And there's some other place in the middle between those that I, I don't find enough thriving models of, or maybe they're there, but they're difficult to articulate. And and that boldness to be able to go to that middle place because a university or a Mennonite church, I think are better at preserving than at growing. And, and to be that counterpoint of the growing and the preserving, and, and something that's so, entering into all of those cycles is is where I think we've, we've got a whole lot more to do. Well, the only illustration to the whole summit was remember he, he I don't think altogether legitimately used the parable of the sower and the seed, right? And he was saying, you know, uh, are we sowing enough seed? You know, Jesus presumed a 75% failure rate. And uh, what you just said about we're into preserving, uh, I, I wonder to myself, well, how many new things have I just tried? with the assumption that many of these things will fail, and that is okay, you know, uh, because I think I, when I do try new things and it doesn't fly, then, then I beat myself up. And so I, rather than say, I just have to have a lot more tries out there, I say, well, I care for that one seed and put a little fence around it, water it and stuff like that to make sure that one seed goes, rather than say, I'm going to scatter 20 seeds and try 20 different things, and, and two or three of them will, will grow into the tree. You know, that's so helpful, and, and I think this is a really honest struggle, and this is why we're struggling, because there's also that thing that we were being told a whole lot of, like, choose your non-negotiables, and these are the three things you're going to do, hone in and be good at them, yeah. you know, and um, I'm not sure that we're addressing those kind of ideas far enough yeah. in, in this context, and, and yet coming out of there, I think we're left with that tension, and that's where we need to be going, we're doing something. Yeah, I think that's that's misled if we don't actually grab that problem and work at it. I want to let uh, our online participants know that we have a few minutes to get a question in yet before we wrap up. Uh, we do want to ask you also to consider what is your key takeaway? And let us know. Share that. Text it in. And uh, like to gather some of those together. Any other questions from online? Yeah, my, my question is, uh, Bill Hybels made a great deal about the idea that the local church is the hope of the world. And in his book, Courageous Leadership, he then also adds and uh, something to the effect, and, and the fate of a local church depends on its leaders. My question is, to what extent do the panelists see the idea of the local church being the hope of the world as being consistent with our Mennonite Church Canada missional church emphasis, which says God is out there working, and let's see if we can get on board with God. At what point are those two ideas consistent with each other, and at what point do they diverge? Yeah, I, I, I just, I'll just want to repeat the question for a minute. Ray Friesen is asking, uh, is there, is the, or identifying a tension between the statement that the local church is the hope of the world and a missional a view that says God is at work in the world and the call of the church is to watch for, identify what God is doing and come alongside God to help God in God's mission. Don, you were starting to respond. Yeah, the, when, I, when I thought about that phrase, I, I've often wondered, is it idolatrous? You know, to, to say that the local church is the hope of the world. I, I always thought Jesus was the hope of the world, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I think this missional church understanding that we look and we watch and see what God's doing in the world, we can use that as an excuse for laziness or an excuse for passivity. Uh, but um, I, I really don't think that's the message that I get from Scripture, is that, that the local church is the whole world. The local church is tremendously important, uh, but, but Jesus is not the whole world. If I attempted to be generous in my interpretation of that statement, because yeah. I, I struggle with the yeah. same thing, it would be that 
Um, you said, you know, Jesus is the hope of the world. Well, often paired with the term missional is the term incarnational, in the sense that uh, the missional incarnational church uh, participates with God's love. In that sense, the local church is an expression of Christ's incarnational presence in the world. It's still Christ who's the hope, but he's, for reasons beyond our understanding, he's chosen us to be an expression of that incarnation. And in that sense, I can say, you know, the, the local church is an expression of, of Christ's hope in the world. But I, I did run into the same tension. Christine or Cheryl, anything to add to this? Other than that, I wrote down exactly the same thing. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's something that we share in common. Um, it's not a question of what is our role. You know, there was also that, you know, the therefore go or these other things that, that were presented to us, uh, which is in a sense an opposite kind of thing, but it's, I think it's the problem of too much of a slogan, really, is you know, rather than, than a, a wrong, than a real tension. And so how are, how are these biblical notions helpful for us without becoming slogans that actually raise these tensions? Um, say that it is, well, it, I think I like the word ah uh, rather than the, and, and there's a few others we need yeah. to be looking for at the same time. Yeah. But let's, let's not sort of rain on the party and, and, not, um, and not endorse the good that, that happens through the local church. I've been preaching a sermon as I get into the constituency over those last year or so which talks about the future of the church, and I draw on Ephesians, where Paul says very clearly it's through the church that God expects to complete the work of, of bringing the kingdom into being. And so there is a kind of resonance between that and the local church is the hope of the world, but I think it's not quite as presumptuous uh, in saying it's the local church. It is the church, which has many expressions uh, and, and many forms. <laughs> Are there any other questions coming? Let, let me toss in a question here at the risk of, of uh, you know, in, in introducing a, a, another thought that might, we may not have time to complete. Um, in your participation in the, in the, uh, in the summit, were, were you aware of people whose uh, ethnicity might not have been Eastern European or Western European or Caucasian? And how would this event have spoken to their context and their uh, identity as people of non-white origin, or was it was it a pretty monochromatic experience? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes to the last. Question. Yeah, I, th I think it, I think it was. I mean, <laughs> dealing with with privilege with respect to to race and gender is so difficult and multi-layered, right? Um, and, and as a white male, I think it's just sound like I'm defending myself. Um, I, yes, I think it was uh, fairly homogenous in its expression. I think that that would be um, a problem. But I mean, I think that's a, I think that's an increasing challenge trying to do a large-scale event in a world that maintains its massive diversity and yet is connected immediately through technology and, and so forth. Um, so I, I, I thought, you know, they had Pranitha uh, speaking, um, and, I, and I loved what she shared. I found it really inspirational. But at the same time, I noted that her her contribution was um, more of a testimonial inspiration, and I would have loved to hear what, like, a little bit more of the, but just be inspired by people from other cultures. I want to learn from the nuts and bolts of what yeah. makes them. Like Jim Collins, Patrick Mencioni, their, their speeches were prescriptive. This yeah. is what you should do. Bill Hybels preached in a prescriptive way. Uh, Renata, it was descriptive. She said, this is what I've done. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, would have liked to have, have heard her teach. Or let's have the others give their testimony <laughs> instead of doing, you know, like let's have some... Carly's was, was more compelling in that sense. And to have other leaders do the testimonial thing, I think I took more away from Carly than the ones who gave the prescription, even though they gave me some helpful points that I'll probably use. Um, and it is, 
you know, just what do we do from here? Um, like you don't want to wither away into into only testimony, although I was found wanting more of it on, on yeah. that one. Well, it raises the, it kind of raises the point that you know what what is the role of testimony on the part of leaders themselves? And it wasn't one of the intent. I don't think the intent of the summit itself, but when some of the testimonies themselves were perhaps more compelling than some of the content of some of the other speakers, uh, I think I think it urges us to think about our own testimonies as leaders and how can we employ that as a leadership development tool and as a leadership tool in our congregations and and leadership settings. And was it only women who gave testimonies? All three women gave testimonies. Uh, yeah, well, no, Bill uh, yeah. okay. he, he, he okay. goes in and out of testimonies mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah, there were, there that's were right. Yeah, that's right. There were some yes. Well, I want to make sure that we don't miss a chance to hear uh, hear from from uh, online folks about takeaways. Even if it's uh, three words or four words, text it in, and uh, we'd like to share them around. Also, want to stress that we want to receive your feedback about this this webinar and the event itself. Uh, we, we'd like to hear from you because we want to be able to continue to offer things that are useful to you as leaders and will help to serve uh, in in the settings in which you are serving. Uh, as we're wrapping up and perhaps waiting for some online comments. I want to invite you as panelists to say to give a sentence or two about what's, what stands out as a takeaway for you from this seminar, summit. summit. My thing is what you uh, said at the beginning was um, uh, you quoted Bill Hybels who said something like, uh, you're not a leader so that you can be a responder. Um, and uh, I just think about how I structure my day. You know, you turn on your computer, you see the 17 emails, and you begin your day by responding rather than saying, I'm going to work on my six by six. You know, and to say, hey, the computer stays off or email stays off until I've done my meeting, and then I can respond to um, all the bombarding uh, requests for information or decisions. Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Similar way, actually, you're not a leader by only resisting either. And so we've talked about some of the things that maybe we weren't quite comfortable with. And yet what I more strongly took away is the things that, that I wanted to work at and, and do things differently. And 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 where where I actually saw lots of hope of what's possible through the church at large and through the Mennonite church in particular ways. Um and and just to have the the places and the time to to work at those things that, that So I'll share one more quote. Um, we can do no great things. We can only do small things with great impact. And I would add, by God's grace. Um, so that was from Mark Gilberger. And I think for me, those are those are powerful words. Jamie? Um, well, I was I was thinking about Craig Rochelle's story about how he brought all the frat boys and you know, how the leader pointed them out and, and uh, um, connecting it to what Don was talking about earlier about how they're you know it's rare to find those people who are willing to unusual approach um, like that pastor. I mean, uh, Don, you and and your church have, have championed our church and, and my wife and I's leadership. But we're, we're able to do what we do today, and so that that story of identifying uh, the unusual, the you know the anomaly, and, and not 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 to, to belittle the, the pastors that are coming out of institutions and stuff like that, but to say that you know sometimes the seeds don't land on good soil. Sometimes they land you know on on concrete. And our church, little flowers, one of the funny images of it is that flower that possibly survives between a crack in the concrete, and. Uh, so I would say you know, that one of the takeaways for us is just to, I want to I want to help champion other people like us in the communities like ours and encourage um, churches in Mennonite Church Canada to do what I think Douglas Mennonite has done as an example of championing them. 
Uh, is there any moment comment? I don't know how many of you watch that. There's, you know what TED Talks are? You know, uh, there's a TED Talk called The First Follower, and he. The, the speaker says leaders are overrated, and he has this little video of uh, an outdoor concert. It's taken with a cell phone, and there's some guy doing a crazy dance out on the field, and everyone's looking at him as if he's just crazy. And then finally, after a long uh, wait, someone actually gets up and starts dancing. And once that first guy starts dancing, then the second and the third, soon the whole crowd is up and doing this crazy dance. And and this TED Talk speaker says, I think sometimes leaders are are overrated. What we have to do is be very careful about uh, our energies in becoming a first follower because we can make a critical difference saying, of all these people doing crazy things out of there, that's the one I'm going to follow and let my legitimacy and my support. Thank you. And on that note, let's uh, bring this to a close. Thank you again for joining in this uh, uh, Canada-wide conversation. And thanks to the panelists, CMU for providing the technical facilities and the space to meet, and to Max Canada. To Rich, who's been uh, behind the scenes making sure that everything's working in this room and so that you can hear. Thanks very much. Have a good day and a good week.